Today's webinar, we're going to take a look at the Eddie's Electronics reference application that's included with Zojo uh, so that we can take a look at how a SQLite app can be made using Zojo. Now, this application has both a desktop and a web version, and we'll try to take a look at both and see uh, some of the similarities between the two and see how uh, the database code is almost exactly the same between the two. And uh, as usual, uh, I encourage everyone to uh, just type their questions as they think of them into the little question window. I'll uh, pop over and, and see that on my other screen as I'm uh, talking, and uh, I'll try to address them throughout the webinar. And uh, so without further ado, let's start this thing up. So here I have Zojo running at the project chooser, and uh, I conveniently have uh, pre-opened these things so that we can do it jump to them quickly. So I'm going to open up the desktop version, and that's uh, EEWeb. And if you wanted to find these things, they're actually down here in the examples, in the example applications folder. So you can follow along at home should you want uh, here in the Eddie's Electronics folder. I've actually copied them out to a different location so I can save and make changes and whatnot. This is probably one of the more complex examples that's included uh, with Zojo. And uh, uh, speaking of which, I will show you here in the finder uh, just some of how the structure is. So you can see here, actually, I'm going to do the column view. That's a little easier to see, I think. So you can see in the Eddie Electronics folder, there, there's, there is a couple folders here. We have the desktop folder, which has the desktop project. And these other files are actually copied in when you run the project, which we'll see. We have the web folder, which has the web project. And uh, the graphics folder contains graphics that's shared across both projects. And the database folder has the database stuff that's shared uh, in both the web and the desktop projects. In particular, the main uh, SQLite database, which you can see right here, is, uh, is contained in this folder. And there's also a little tool that generates demo data uh, for this database so that we can keep it fresh. So that's just the general structure. And because that structure is a little more complicated, it does sometimes work a little better if you just copy the whole folder off somewhere else to somewhere else on your uh, drive rather than trying to open it right from the examples folder. But anyway, this here is the project. And you can see on the left-hand side how it's organized. And we have a, a folder here with the user interface stuff that has all the windows and controls and whatnot. Uh, there's a graphics folder, and this just contains all the uh, necessary graphics that are used, and they come from that graphics folder we saw in the finder. And then there's a database folder, and this just has in it a single uh, class that is responsible for all communication with the database. And actually, this class is used exactly the same in both the desktop and uh, the web uh, versions of this tool. So you can see is it uh, provides one way that if you're creating apps that run in both places, how you can uh, essentially encapsulate or keep all your database code in one place and not have the user interface have to worry about it. So the main window here, actually, I'm going to run the app so that you can see what we're dealing with. And then we'll take a look in some of the code. So you can see when you run the app what you get here. In the database, there's a customer table that has a bunch of customer names. And they have all kinds of information associated with it, you know, address information and whatnot. And when you click on each customer name, that information is loaded from the database and then displayed here in these fields. In addition, there is a table of invoices that are associated with each customer. And you can see that here is the list of the invoices for the customer. So when you click on a customer, it gets the data for the customer, and then it fetches all the invoices for the customer and puts them here in the list. You can add invoices or you can edit them. When you edit an invoice, you get yet another list of all the items that are in the invoice. And you can see here the particular items that are loaded up. And then you can add new items or you can edit the existing items and you can update them in the database or whatnot. So 
So let's quit that. So the first thing that comes up is this main customer entry window. So let's expand that and take a look at some of its methods. Now you can see here there's quite a few methods on it. So I'm going to expand the uh, also the properties so you can see what's tracked here. And you can see there's all kinds of controls. Now I suspect uh, if I can find the right control I'm looking for here, here it is, customer list. If you look at the uh, open event handler on customer list, this is called when the window comes up and that um, list of customers, the, the list box control appears on the window, the open event handler is called. And this is calling the load customers method. And you can see in the methods area right here is load customers. Now here you can see there's just a few lines of code, but this is what's uh, populating the list box. Now the first two lines are doing a record set. And then it calls, you can see right here, the orders database, and it's calling a method. Now we're gonna jump back to the initialization code so you can see where that is all coming from. So you can see the very first line of the application, the app open event. This particular app is assigning a property that's on the app. You can see right here, orders. And it's an orders database, which is our class that I, I briefly showed you before, we'll take a look at. And it's calling on that class uh, a method called set up the database. Since we're gonna be jumping around here a lot, I'm gonna open this up in its own tab. So you can see set up new database is actually a shared method, which is why in this particular example, I didn't need to instantiate it. And it's shared because it only needs to be called once. And you can see what this um, code is doing here. It first is looking for the database file itself and making sure that it exists. And then if it's not, it's popping up, popping up an error for you to say that it didn't get copied properly. And you can see on the build settings, there's a copy file step whose only purpose in life is to copy the SQLite database from the databases folder over to where the application gets built so that it can be used. So when your app is built, it copies the database over, your app starts, it verifies that it can load the database, And then it, I'm just reading the comment here, it creates an in-memory database. I'm not sure it still does that. That comment might not be valid. Yeah, it's not doing it in memory anymore. I need to change that comment. The older version did it in memory. The, uh, now that it found the file, and these are the key lines here. You can see it's creating a new instance of the orders database. It's setting the database file property to be the file that we found up here. And then it's attempting to connect to it. And if it can't connect, it puts up an error. But if it does connect, it returns the database itself. And that is what, if we go back to the app method over here, gets assigned to the property. So this one little line of code is doing a bunch of things, uh, finding the database file itself, uh, creating a new instance of the database, assigning the file to it, and then connecting to it. And then if we know that everything happened properly and it's not nil, uh, then we are displaying the customer details window. Otherwise, it will just immediately quit. That's just the startup code to connect to the database. And that's usually pretty straightforward, particularly with SQLite, because it's just a file that you are gonna know where it is and you can point to it and then connect to it. Now you can see here all the methods. 
that we put on the order da orders database class. And again, this class is a subclass of SQLite, of, of the SQLite database. And we did it that way so that we ha essentially now have a container to put all the code that is touching the database. Because the other option would be where well, you could put all your database access code uh, right in the window itself. And that would work just fine. Uh, but because this particular example is trying to show how you um, would create a similar desktop and web app, it didn't make a lot of sense to have all the database access code uh, within the user interface, because that would mean that the, um, the web uh, app wouldn't be able to use any of the desktop code and vice versa, because their user interfaces are different and they don't share anything. Uh, their web pages instead of windows and web buttons instead of push buttons, that sort of thing. So by uh, encapsulating all this code here, we can keep these, uh, these methods that do very specific things uh, regarding pulling data back or updating data or, or whatnot into their own little home so that they're shared across the application. I'll open this up in a new tab also since this is a window we'll probably be looking at quite a bit. All right, before I jump into this, I see we have one question here. What are SQLite limitations uh, regarding users? Um, I will, uh, if you haven't used SQLite before, and I can jump over to that real quick, probably a good idea. It's an open source, uh, essentially single user database. Um, so as far as the number of users go, generally speaking, one is what you want with SQLite. It's intended as a database that's used with an app that uh, that's run right alongside the app. It's considered an embedded database because its engine is right embedded in the app itself. You can use it with a web app and it can work with more than one user, uh, but only one user is actually going to be modifying the file at a time. So that's, uh, that's something to keep in mind if, you're, if your website has a lot of users that are making a lot of um, requests that could result in database modifications. Uh, there could be delays as, you know, these essentially get queued up and one happens right after another. Uh, there are uh, settings you can do on SQLite to tweak that a little bit so it'll write to disk a lot faster and, and that uh, queuing will happen very quickly. But still, under the hood, there's still only one user accessing the database at any time. All right. So looking back over here, let's open up, let's open up these methods. So the load customers method, where we all began, is creating a record set and is simply populating, excuse me, is simply populating the list of customers. So we create the record set and then we fill the record set with the customers. Now you can see here that this uh, particular thing has an optional parameter that allows you to search. If it's blank, it's just going to get all the customers. Uh, but if you specified a, a name of some kind, it'll just filter and return down uh, the customers that were requested. So let's take a look at this particular method here, find customers by name. Now you can see here, this isn't terribly long. All this is doing is putting together the SQL statement and then returning the record set back uh, so that it can be iterated and uh, used to fetch the information out and then put in the list box. This particular code is using uh, a prepared statement, which you can see right here at the very first line. And the prepared statement essentially just says select from customers and the star means get all the columns that are on the customers table and it's doing uh, a where to map. So here it's saying where the last name is like and then we put in a question mark that's the prepared statement part that indicates the uh, first parameter we want to substitute. So then we're matching on either the first name uh, the last name or the first name. And then it's just being sorted by last name and then first name. So that's what the SQL statement looks like when using a prepared statement. You use these question marks instead of uh, 
some other character or even uh, doing it the other way, which would be to, you know, use string concatenation to stuff the value in there. And the reason to use prepared statements is uh, uh, first because of performance. Uh, these statements end up being cached behind the scenes by SQLite. So if they're executed over and over, SQLite does not have to reprocess the SQL statement as far as interpret the commands or whatnot. It'll still have to fetch the data, but it won't have to re- uh, interpret the commands and that can make uh, some amount of difference for more complicated commands uh, and the other reason is from a security standpoint uh, particularly with a web app uh, you have to worry about this uh, this thing called uh, sql injection which can happen when if you're doing string concatenation an unscrupulous user could enter as their username some uh, sql commands and format it just so just in the right way so that your string concatenation would actually end up creating two commands, a normal select command and then another command that maybe does something a little nefarious. So uh, using a prepared statement prevents that because these things are substituted by the database engine directly into the command and don't allow that sort of thing to happen. So once you've created the prepared statement using that syntax, you have to bind in um, the types and the values. So you can see the first two statements here are binding in the first uh, parameter. So that's the first question mark that's in the, uh, the SQL and saying it's a text. And then it's, the second one is also a text. So we're dealing with, with two names here. And then the next two bind commands bind in the actual string. And in this case, we're binding in the uh, the name, uh, whatever was typed, or well, in this case, what was typed in the search field gets eventually gets passed in here as the parameter. So we're using the parameter, and that's getting uh, bound to the SQL statement. And we're tacking on the little print the uh, percent operator because that's used with like as a wildcard, so that it'll find anything that starts with what was typed or what was supplied here. And then lastly, we just uh, assign the record set to the results of that select statement. And then we return the record set. So when it comes back here, we now have a record set. And uh, this code is checking if the record set is not nil. Uh, it does not have uh, an error clause here, it looks like, uh, because if it is nil, odds are that uh, there was some problem processing the SQL. And it could come back nil if you typed the table wrong or had something in your SQL that was uh, that caused it to be invalid, in which case you're, you're probably going to want to uh, check for errors there. Uh, but because these things are fixed, they're not uh, likely to have errors after you've got them working. Uh, and then this particular thing just loops through and uh, updates the customer list list box. There's a, a few other little uh, tricks that are in here regarding locking changes that handle some updates of things. Um, but the big important ones are first, the uh, all the rows are deleted, and then we just loop through all the uh, items in the record set. And then we add a row to the list box with the last name, a comma, and the first name. And then we add to the row tag the ID. And that's the primary key for the table. And that allows us to look up the rest of the fields when uh, that row is clicked on in the list box. And we'll see that in a moment. So we add a row, we move to the next one, we add the row till we get through the whole list. Uh, and then this just sets the, uh, the first one in the list to be selected. So this code does one thing, and that's populate the, uh, the list of the customers on the left-hand side of the customer details window. So it's populating this list right here. Now, when you click on something in there, the change event handler is called. So you can see here, uh, now there's a little bit of code here to just check if some fields need to be cleared or make sure something's selected, but essentially it ends up getting down here. And this, uh, you know, when we know something's selected, we can make sure all the fields are enabled. 
And then we get that ID that we saved in the row tag. Row tags are incredibly useful. Uh, on list boxes when you're dealing with databases. And, you know, obviously you're going to use list boxes with databases because databases contain lots of rows of information and list boxes are a great way to display lots of rows of information. Um, and a row tag is a great way to save primary key for the row that you're showing. So we now got the current customer ID and we pulled it out of the row tag. So now we know that, all right, that's the one they selected on, that's the ID of the customer that was clicked. So the load customer fields method gets called. And then that's followed by the load invoices method. And you can see how that's broken out. They could be combined into one thing, but it's handier and usually better code design to have these things separated into different methods. So let's take a look at load customer fields. And you can see here, that it's first verifying that we actually have a current customer ID. And if, if you tried to load a customer field for some reason and you didn't have a customer ID, well, it's, you know, that's not going to work. And again, we're doing the record set. And the record set, you know, you're going to see that a lot here because that's the way you get at the data that's in the database. It always comes back in some sort of record set that you iterate through. And it may just have one row in it, but it may have multiple ones. And again, it's calling a method on the uh, our orders class, and it's called find the customer by ID. And we're passing in that current ID that uh, that we saved. And then again, we check if it's got an actual value back here. And then uh, this is only going to have a single row, or at least we're you know we're only getting the first row anyway. So we're just assigning all the different fields that are in the window to the value each of the values that are on that table. And you can see the names here, the first name, last name, blah, blah, blah. These are all text, uh, except for the last one, which is a Boolean because that's a checkbox. Then it gets the photo, and that's the picture that you see off to the right uh, from the database. And it puts that into a picture. And then you can see here there's a little bit of a uh, uh, conditional compilation because on Linux, um, the image well wasn't uh, cropping the photo, so it was uh, bleeding outside and overlap overlapping some things. So we put a little code in here just to trim it, and that was an issue on Windows and OS 10. Uh, so that just has the simple code to just assign the photo to the image well, and then the uh, record set gets closed. So let's jump to find customers by ID. And you can see it automatically jumped there for me because I held down the command key when I double clicked on it. That's another little IDE shortcut you can do. You can also right click on it and select here, go to, and it'll have highlighted the name here and it will jump to it. So find customers by ID is again, uh, you know, pretty simple uh, bit of code here. There's another select statement. And this is using ID as the method to look up the customer. And again, it's a prepared statement, so we're binding the type and then we're binding the ID. We get the record set populated by calling SQL select and we return it. And this is a pretty simple standard pattern that you see, you know, get a bunch of data from the database and display it in some manner. Uh, so that this is a pattern you'll end up repeating a lot in your database applications. So let's look at uh, making changes and saving the data. You can see here there's a save method, and you know if you want to see how that's called, we can, uh, you know, if you if you run the app. You can see here, you know, I, let's see, I can make a change here. If I can type, I'm gonna type Harrisburg. I have no idea if that's a real town or whatnot. And there's an update or save button right here in this check mark, so I can hit save. And then if I picked a different person and went back, you can see it, it saved the information because I hit the save button. 
so obviously changing database data and saving the changes is pretty important. So how do you go about doing that? Well, just so you can see how that gets called, we're going to uh, take a look at the toolbar on this window. So if I go to the layout and I click on the toolbar, you can see in its action event handler that it just has a simple case statement that's checking the name of each of the buttons. And then if the button is clicked, it's calling a particular method. And this starts to show you why uh, a lot of these things where uh, where the code is, is in methods rather than in event handlers. And it's so they can be called from multiple places. Um, if I had put the code for load customers in the list box open event handler, then the show all button would not have had access to that because it's in the event handler of a list box. You can't directly call that. But because that code is actually used in apparently at least these two places, it's called when the window starts to load everything, but it's also called when you click the show all, and that's to redisplay all the customers after you may have done a filter, for example. Um, it makes sense to extract that out of the event handler into its own method and then just call the method from the two places it's used. So you can see here the save button, the one we're talking about at the moment, calls a method called save, which is right here. So here you can see that it's again checking to make sure we have a valid customer ID. And again, we're going back to the record set. We're fetching a record set just like we did before. Uh, find the customer by that ID. But then the little uh, command we're using here is we're putting the record set in edit mode by calling the edit method. And a question I'm just noticing that's related to that, so before I go any further, is why is the ID a string and not an integer? Uh, the string, the sorry, the ID is probably an integer, but I'm just passing it around as a string uh, so that I don't have to do as much. Uh, I think it's probably actually an artifact of doing string concatenations, because uh, if it would pass around as an integer, you know, I would have had to use the str method to convert it to a string before I could put it in the, uh, the SQL statement. But with the change to prepared statements, that probably isn't even uh, an issue anymore, because I would just bind an integer instead of a string. So that's probably just something I need to go and update there's no real uh, uh, benefit to having it as one or the other, really. Uh, so the edit mode puts the uh, the record set, or the edit method puts the record set in edit mode. And that allows us to start assigning values to the fields. So essentially, we put it in edit mode. And then each of the fields get assigned whatever happens to be in the text uh, field on the window. So if the user types something in differently, it will get reassigned to the field. Then the update method is called to send those changes back to the database. And then the record set is closed. So in this particular case, this is what causes the database to get updated with the, the values. It's essentially doing a save. Now you can see right here, after uh, that is run, there's a test here to see if there was any errors. And if there were, a message is displayed. Now, hopefully you're not going to see errors here, uh, but the type of things that could generate an error are uh, the database could get locked. Um, it could have been, I suppose, even deleted at some point uh, while the app is running. Uh, so things like that could cause uh, an error. And generally, you want to be notified of those sort of things. Um, you know, other things that could cause errors while you're in the development process is you could type uh, a column name wrong or something like that that would cause it to fail. Um, but that's the sort of stuff you would find while you're developing and testing. But again, you're going to want to be notified of them. So displaying them in some manner, a message box is quick and easy. Um, having a, a log file that you write the errors out to is, is sometimes also helpful. Uh, if you're deploying apps out to customers or something like that, a log file can be very helpful in case uh, the error occurred at the customer's installation or the customer site and they didn't save the, the uh, error message or take a screenshot of it which happens uh, fairly often, you can say, well, you know, the app did save log files, you know, here to the desktop or wherever you put them, uh, you know, send me that, and then you can review a log file. 
so after it's uh, successfully saved, uh, the last step that happens here is the name gets updated in the list. And this is a you know an important thing to remember because um, if you're you know even though you've saved it to the database, uh, the list box was loaded earlier from what was in the database. So you know if if the database came up with the name you know Bob Roberts and it shows on the left hand side Bob Roberts and then you edit the name to say uh, Billy Roberts. Well, the database now says Billy Roberts, but the list box is still you know on the screen and it's it's going to say Bob unless you go back and either reload all the customers on that list from the database, which is probably overkill. Or in this particular case, we can just go directly to the row that's currently selected and update the field with the current information. And if your list happened to show more than just the name, well, you probably would have to go back and update you know, more information. But in our case, we're only showing the name. So you can see that in action. You know, by if I change this to a Y, you can see that it's updating it here. Otherwise, it would stay with the IE, and that wouldn't look good. That would end up being filed as a bug in your app. All right, here's a quick question that's popped up here on the list. Do you have to check for an error after trying to put it in edit mode? Actually, yeah, you probably should check for an error immediately after putting it in edit mode uh, because there are cases where it won't, you won't be able to go in edit mode. Uh, and in the case of SQLite, uh, the only one that I'm aware of is if your, your select statement does not include the primary key. So you'd get an error that would say, primary key is needed in order to update the database, something along those lines. And you would want to be notified by that, as otherwise the edit here is going to fail. Uh, these commands won't uh, do anything. The update will probably also fail. You probably eventually would get the error down here. Um, but it certainly wouldn't hurt to do another error check right up here. And actually, I'm going to make a note of that, because I probably should go through this and add even more stringent error handling to make that point very clear. Uh, another question that's here is what happens when another uh, user accesses the data while it's in edit mode? And that's a SQLite thing. Uh, essentially, when the data is in edit mode, the database is locked. So only uh, the process that has the lock is going to be able to change the database. If any other process, or if it's a web app, that would mean any other uh, user connected to the web app tries to go into edit mode, uh, edit is going to return an error in that case, uh, saying the database is locked. So there are two cases. Um, and in that case, you, you can either just wait a moment and try to edit again, or you can uh, put up a message that says can't edit right now, uh, database is locked. Uh, it, you, what to do in that situation will depend on your app and its design. Uh, I imagine it makes sense to just wait a moment and try it again uh, if most of the edits are quick. And an edit like this would be very quick uh, because, you know, we're, the user clicked the save button. So this is all happening in a split second. Uh, where you, bad things would happen is if you decided to put the thing in edit mode and didn't do an update. Uh, you know, it, maybe if your user interface had a button that you clicked and said, all right, allow data to be edited. And then when they click that, you enabled edit mode. And then you let the user just take, you know, however long they wanted to make the changes on the, the window. And you didn't update the database until they hit a button. Well, then you've got a time, an undetermined amount of time there that could cause a real problem for your app. So you don't want to do it that way. You want to have, you know, allow the updates to happen and then, you know, process them as quickly as possible in your app so that the locking is absolutely minimized. Uh, and there's a question about rollbacks and commits. Uh, this particular code doesn't have um, a commit because it doesn't really need it. Uh, and the way SQLite database works is if you, if you make a change, it's automatically committed. 
but it's just one item at a time. So here I'm doing the edit, I'm making the changes, I'm doing the updates. So all these things are going to be automatically committed. If you wanted to do a transaction where you made a bunch of changes all at once, uh, then you would start a transaction manually using the begin transaction command. And you would close it manually doing the uh, commit command. Uh, there might be cases of that in here that we'll see. I don't quite remember offhand. And the reasons for the two are just how C that's just how SQLite works. Uh, but generally, you'd want to go with a transaction uh, for probably a couple reasons. Uh, one is performance. If you're doing a bunch of changes all at once, uh, it is much faster to um, start a transaction, do a bunch of changes, and then commit them at the end as opposed to doing essentially an implicit commit after each change as that requires uh, data uh, disk writing and whatnot. So SQLite's a little slower about that. And the other thing is for transactional integrity. Um, depending on how you're changing the data, um, you may not want part of the changes to succeed. You either want all of them to succeed or none of them to succeed. And that's another um, very important reason to use transactions. And do you need to do a rollback if an error occurred? Uh, if you're in a transaction, yeah, rollback makes sense. Uh, here, I don't think a rollback is necessary. You know, I haven't tested that with the single line command. But certainly, if you're in a transaction and you get some sort of failure, yes, you're going to want to do a rollback. Uh, da -da -da. And there's one other question here on the, uh, let me just jump ahead here to, there's a question about the multi-user property. And I'm just going to bring up the page for SQLite database so you can see it all. The multi-user property is right here. And this enables, you know, it's called multi-user here in um, Zojo. But it enables the, uh, the SQLite property called write-ahead logging. Uh, and there's some links here you can read about that. But essentially, it, it, it's how it handles uh, the writing to the disk. And uh, this isn't something I have memorized, so I'm just going to take a quick peek here at what the description is. And now you know why I jumped to the language reference page. Uh, yes, with, with uh, write-ahead logging enabled, um, changes are written to it. There's actually two files for your SQLite database, a, uh, the main database file itself and the write-ahead log. So when you write to the database, there's just always a single write. Boom, it's right into the write-ahead log very fast, very fast, one single write. But if you have the normal mode, which is the journaling mode, uh, SQLite will make the changes to the original database file, and it also write to a rollback file uh, what the original data was. So that's two disk writes which takes twice as much time. So essentially, write-ahead logging is faster because it's writing to the disk less often. Um, but there are some uh, restrictions associated with it. But it is particularly useful to turn on write-ahead logging when you are dealing with web apps because you want um, the amount of time the database is locked for writing to be absolutely minimized. So that's the effect of it. There's probably no real reason to turn it on for a desktop app that already has just a single user uh, working with it. All right, so this was the save code here. Let's take a look here. I want to see what other routines would make the most sense. Load invoices was the one that was called after the load customer fields method. And just so you can see what that looks like. You know, doing again the same sort of thing. Record sets are everywhere. And it's calling another method called get invoices for the current customer. And then it's populating that invoice list with the information. And you can see this particular thing is using another prepared statement. And it's getting all the columns from the invoices table that match that particular customer and sending it back. You can see the search uh, method, which gets called when uh, someone types in the search field which is displayed in a window in this particular app. 
it essentially is also calling the load customers method, providing the, uh, the search text. So now we're up to three calls of the load customers method. Uh, the, the original open event, the show all button, and now uh, the search method. And you'll notice looking at all these methods, how they all have a little red dot next to them. This means they're marked as private. You can see that over here. Um, and that is because none of these methods need to be accessed outside of this particular window. And it's pretty good habit to mark your methods as private by default uh, because it, it, you know, it, it makes your code immediately uh, more encapsulated and, and less fragile. Because as soon as it's private, you know, okay, nothing else can call this. If you make it global, it's possible something else could call this. It's possible you could say, oh, well, it, it's real easy. It's already here. I'll just call it. And then all of a sudden, you created a dependency between maybe another window and this window or something like that. And th not that there's necessarily anything wrong with that, but you don't want to do that accidentally um, or casually. You want to be very specific about your dependencies. So by making everything private by default, it forces you to think about your dependencies. So if it turns out that I was another place in the app where I wanted to call search for customer, if I tried to do it and then I ran my app, it would tell me it wouldn't be allowed because this method is private. So then I need to think, all right, do I really want, just want to call this method directly or do I want to rethink my design a little bit to maybe make this uh, a little clearer? So it gives you a little bit of a, a way to catch yourself from doing anything you might regret later. All right, let's just run this again so we can see what's going on here and then see what might be the next thing to look at. All right, actually, the next thing to look at is probably look at the web app so we can see some of the similarities between the code here. Uh, let's see here. I just got a couple questions I want to jump to before that. Uh, what is the order in which records are processed using move next? Uh, the order in which records are processed are the order that you requested them from the database. So if you if you sent in an order by clause, the records are going to come back in that specific order. So if you you know if I ordered them by you know last name, they'll come back in last name order. If I ordered them by ID, they'd come back in ID order. If I don't specify an order by clause, in the case of SQLite, they usually come back in ID order. Uh, but I don't believe that's specifically that's actually specified by SQLite, so you, I don't know you can depend on that. So if you if you do require a specific order, use the order by clause, specify the column that gives you the data in the order you want. Uh, can SQLite be used in commercial apps without getting into problems like having to share source? Um, uh, one good thing about SQLite is it's actually public domain, which is uh, about as free as things can get. So yeah, there's no restrictions on using SQLite in commercial apps, none whatsoever. All right, I don't know that I understand this uh, list of search replace rules for move next. So that, Marcus, you can add a little info what you mean there. I will reread that in a moment. All right, so looking here, we went through the population of this list. Uh, the data here and the invoice and you, like I said the pattern is pretty much the same you know if you looked at the code for edit invoices you see the same sort of record set that's getting this information here and displaying it in this list box displaying the information here update would work very similarly to the save here where it's checking all the values here and assigning them so that they get saved to the database uh, you tend to repeat yourself a little bit with some of that stuff and the sales report just gets data, again, from the database. It sums up the data, grouping it by, uh, I guess, the month, and then plots it on this little graph here. But before we run out of time, I want to open up the web version. So you can see the web one. It has very similar layout as the desktop one. I'm going to run that here. So like I said, very, very similar. Um, 
you know, you click stuff here, these values get populated, the invoice list gets populated, you click on things, you can edit them. It all works and looks very similar. So let's look at the code. Now this is the web app. And you can see here, this uh, this is web specific code to start up some uh, logging files. So we can jump ahead. Actually, this session is where I wanted to open up first. So you can see here, in the case of a web app, the session is pretty analogous to the app.open event of a desktop app, because each time a new user connects, a new session is created. So each time a new user connects, we want a new database so that the data is uh, not shared between users. So in the open event handler of the session is essentially the same code that you see in the open event uh, handler of the app for the desktop app. And it's just uh, setting up the database. And this is adding uh, a few extra logging things. Uh, but the main thing is that the database is being uh, set up here. And it's set up the same way. You see it's calling the same method that the desktop app calls. And if you look down here at the bottom, you'll see that there's the same class that's here with the same methods. And the same methods are here because the database code is exactly the same. So if we go to the customer details page, I suspect you're going to see, again, a lot of similarity here. There's methods here that look exactly the same. So there's load customers. And this code, actually this code probably looks exactly the same as the code you saw in load customers on the, uh, on the desktop app. And that's true in this particular case because even though a customer list is a web list box and here, but in on the desktop app, it was just a list box, the methods and properties are all the same. So this code looks exactly the same. Save, again, uh, very similar. This has additional code to, actually the desktop app should probably have this as well. It's updating the map in case uh, you went in and changed the address. It's relocating the map to the new address. And this code again looks very, very similar. And is there a search? Where's the search code on this one? Yeah, this because the search button is uh, embedded in the toolbar that's a little more complicated here whereas the desktop app drops down a little sheet or a dialogue window but essentially the same uh, stuff happens there it's uh, going to pull the customer information back using the search text and you can see save all very similar stuff here Uh, and here's a good question that just came up is why would we not want to share the data between all the web users? Well, again, that depends on your app. Uh, but certainly in most cases, uh, people, you know, depending on the app, of course, people don't expect to see um, other people's data. So uh, the example I did in a prior webinar was a, a to-do list. And it's highly likely that you, uh, you know, you want your own to-dos and, you know, someone else that logs in wants their own to-dos and there's no reason for you to see the other person's to-dos and no reason for them to see yours. Um, that would be a, even considered a privacy violation and something like that maybe. 
So that would be a reason to have the information um, separate for each for each user. In this particular app, uh, it doesn't actually have a, a login screen. So the reason why we're having separate data for each user is just so that you know each user can monkey around with the data and you know do whatever the heck they want. And it doesn't affect someone else connecting uh, the web app, essentially. So it's more of a, a for demo purposes kind of thing. Uh, each user gets a clean database to start looking at the data and making their own changes or whatnot. And then the next person that, that connects to the web app doesn't see all the changes that some other user made. Uh, you know, delete, you know, if they, well, they can't delete the rows. We don't have uh, that capability in the app, but, you know, change all the names to funny names or something like that. So that's why this particular app is uh, creating a new database for each user that connects. But you will find that most web apps you create are going to want to use that particular design philosophy. Uh, and I will point out that the web app has, in addition to the, the main uh, customer details screen that you see here, this one also has alternate web pages for when it's running on a smaller mobile device like a phone. And if I can find where that folder is, here it is. And you can see here, this has different pages set up that are specifically sized to fill. Um, in this case, it's the iPhone screen size. And, uh, you know, the layout is different. It has, uh, you know, a different screen to show the invoices because there's not enough room to show this on all one screen like the, the big main screen does. But again, this uh, uh, where here we go. Right, right in the top line, I skipped ahead too far. It's again calling the uh, a method on our session our, on our orders class, which is a property of the session here because this is a web app. Uh, so again, we're you know the database code remains uh, contained, encapsulated in a single place in that orders database class. And this is just, you know, rather than having this database code scattered throughout your application, um, just waiting for bugs to happen, we put it all in one place so that if something changes, you only have to change it in one place. And an example of that might be, uh, you, know, you know, a crazy thing, but maybe you change your table name from customers to something else. Well, now you really only have to start going to the orders database class and making the updates there as opposed to, you know, finding all the 50 places in your app where you were selecting from that table or, or whatnot and having to update it. And then that jumps, you know, to different screens that show different things. But again, they're all calling the different methods that are in here, which you can see. And these all do various select statements to get the information that's needed by the app. And there is code in here, it looks like, to cancel a transaction, which does a rollback. And there is, this is how you start a transaction using uh, SQLite, is you just call uh, the execute, SQL execute command with the begin transaction SQL command. All right, where was that? I want to close mobile. That's the main window. So this is a, a great app to take a look at. This one is updated pretty much with every release. We're tweaking things in it. I've got a, a note of a few things here I want to clean up for the next release to make it even more appropriate as a, a reference app. Um, one of the things we actually did in the last release for this was a fairly small thing. It didn't have to do with the databases, but we just made sure that when it was running on an iPhone 5, it actually stretched to fill the iPhone 5 screen. It wasn't doing that before. And this is available online to play with as well, if I can find the link. Uh, it used to have a link right around here, so... 
see if I can find it. I'm guessing here, so I'll probably guess wrong. Well, probably got a uh, problem with the case or something. Oh, I don't know where they move that link to on the new page. Well, I'll make sure that that gets added somewhere a little more obvious so that you can all find it. But it is the web app is running somewhere on one of our servers, so you can play around with it on the uh, on the web as well as you know just directly on your own with uh, Zojo by running it. Uh, let's see. Uh, one last question here. We got a couple more minutes, so if you got a few other questions, now would be the time to ask them. Uh, here's the question. Can you edit the database content directly from Zojo or a third party tool? Uh, you can do both of those things. Uh, Zojo has a database editor that's available for databases that are directly added to the project using this uh, method. So I could come here and I could select the database. And you can see here the database now is in the project and the tables are shown and you can see the column names. It doesn't show you any data, it just shows you the column names, it allows you to add new columns. Uh, SQLite does not allow you to uh, change columns, so you can't rename them or change their type or anything like that. But you can add new columns to uh, existing tables. So this is pretty bare bones. Uh, your best bet is to find any SQLite uh, third party tool which will be able to open up these files and modify them uh, and there are far too many to uh, to list. Uh, a popular one is the tools made by the Navicat folks. They have a, pretty much a database editor for every type of database including SQLite and they have free and paid versions. Uh, there's a bunch of Mac ones that are in the Mac App Store. You can just search for SQLite there. I'm sure you'll find quite a few. I think there's even one that's a, a free plugin for of all things Firefox that lets you edit SQLite databases using Firefox. But any tool that can edit a SQLite database will work perfectly fine with any of these. Uh, did, but I don't really need the database in here. So I remove it. And of course, you know, like I had shown earlier, there is the, uh, you know, of course you get the language reference that you can refer to for all the properties or whatnot for how to use any of the databases, including SQLite, um, with some, uh, you know, a little bit of sample code or whatnot. And the user guide also, the framework guide, has a chapter on databases. And one of the sections is SQLite. So you can also refer here, and this covers some of the uh, other specifics of SQLite that are, um, are useful. Uh, the primary keys, very important thing with databases in general, and this is uh, just talks about how they work with SQLite. Oops, scrolled too far. Um, some talk here about the multi-user support that was asked about. Uh, I think I scrolled past. Yeah, the encryption that uh, the SQLite has. Uh, the ability to add uh, large objects, which are blobs or, uh, that can contain pictures and stuff like that. And then a somewhat unique feature of SQLite, which is the ability to attach multiple SQLite databases kind of together. So you use them as one uh, database, which is interesting. And uh, and this little command here is very handy. And, you know, if you ever want to uh, 
you know, generally speaking, we document the version of SQLite we're using here in the language reference page. So you can see here uh, we're using 3714.1. But if you ever want to check that yourself, you can just do something simple like this. You call the library version method of SQLite database um, by just uh, declaring it is new here and not connecting to it. That uh, creates an in-memory database. I don't think I need to call the connect method here, so I think that just works. Um, if it doesn't, we'll call the connect method. Yeah, that's and you can see the the version number there. So if you ever need to check that for any reason, that's how you would do so. And we do try to keep the SQLite version. Um, you know, generally with each uh, release, uh, we, we take a look at the most latest version there and we see if it's appropriate to upgrade our uh, our library with what's out there. Uh, SQLite is constantly maintained and updated, so it's a, it's a great little database. It's very speedy. And for most desktop apps, it's a great uh, database to start with. So it looks like we're a little bit over on time, so I want to thank everyone for attending this webinar. And we can go back to the uh, website here. We have one more webinar this month, and next week's is a uh, chat application. And in that one, we're going to go over the, the chat example, which is a web app, and demonstrate some of the features that allow um, uh, what we call the push functionality. It allows your web app to send commands out to individual um, clients that are connected to it and we'll see how that works in a chat application and how you can use that in general it's pretty cool and then uh, and sometime in the next week I will get the uh, the schedule posted for August with a bunch of topics uh, pretty much all of which will be have been suggested by other people so again if you have uh, suggestions for topics by all means please let me know thanks very much have a great day everyone